Good evening, everyone. Welcome to your third lecture of RCE. Let me start with an announcement, and the announcement is that you must be aware by now that the CAT pattern has changed. Correct, the CAT has announced a different uh, uh, format. Uh, we have our Endeavor, open Endeavor uh, test series going on, right? So Endeavor open mock CAT. The seventh Endeavor open mock CAT will start on Friday at 5 p.m. this Friday, this Friday at 5 p.m. And it will remain active till Sunday, 4 p.m. This will be followed by a webinar on the new CAT pattern and finally, an analysis of the mock, all right? EOM7, you'll find, the dis, uh, you'll find the link to register for this mock in the description uh, box. Please do register, yes. This will be the first mock to be conducted on the lines of the new format. I'm sure you will look forward to this, yes. And uh, incidentally, the webinar is going to cover what can we expect from this new pattern? So a lot of uh, insight and value add for all of you. This is definitely going to help you in your strategizing for the new pattern, all right? So let me repeat this for the ones who've joined late. Uh, you'll find the link in the description box and the link is to register for EOM7. EOM7 is Endeavor Open Mocat 7 as part of our test series, which we've been offering, uh, you know, for all India participants. This, uh, the, the mock will start from 5 p.m. this Friday and will last till, it will remain active till Sunday, Sunday 4 p.m., after which at 5 p.m. there will be a webinar on the revised CAT pattern. This will be followed by an analysis of the CAT, that is EOM7, all right? So I, I hope you participate in this wholeheartedly and that this uh, helps you very much, all right? Let's start. So you can see the, uh, the title of today's lecture, Logical Structure, Organization of the Passage and Related Questions. So just to give you a background, we've had two sessions of RC. And in the first one, we talked about what expectations uh, should we hold with regard to RC, with regard to verbal in general. We also spoke about uh, you know, how to read what is focused reading, how to read in such a manner that you're able to filter out important ideas, you're able to look for those keywords. We looked at types of passages. And in the last lecture, which is um, main idea and related questions, we looked largely at main ideas, right? How to take out, how to take the gist of the passage, how to read in such a manner that I'm able to filter out the main idea of the passage, especially bring it all down to that one or two lines. Uh, we also looked at all those related questions, and the related questions are title, the background of the author, where has this uh, passage been taken from, etc. Right. So today we move to a different chunk, which is dependent on the the way in which that the passage is organized, the structuring of ideas. You will find how things are so interrelated. You know, so I'm not reading a passage or certain lines of the passage. I'm reading in a holistic manner because a passage is a holistic piece, right? It is in some way related, put together in a very, very logical fashion. Uh, let's look at that. So uh, logical structure refers to a logically ordered, connected set of ideas to make it a coherent whole. You're not writing randomly, right? A writer writes with a certain purpose and he makes sure that whatever is written serves that purpose. So there is always a very connected set of things or set of details that a writer brings forth. What, what do we keep in mind while understanding the organization of the passage? We keep in mind the topic, the main idea, right? We try to understand what is the main idea that the author is expressing here, the what can even be the subject. You know, you can even talk the subject. The subject is the broader idea. The main idea is the specific detail or specific aspect of the subject that we are covering. The purpose of the author, why has he written this? The primary objective, is he merely informing, describing, comparing, persuading, criticizing? The primary object, the why of it, which enables us to understand the scope of the writing. That is how far 
is the author going to explain this idea? How far is he going to take this? Or in what direction is he going to take this? What are the things that the author is going to describe or explain in this passage, right? These are the things that we will keep in mind while understanding the organization of the passage, okay? Now, what are those question stems? So if I talk of logical structure and related questions, what are these question stems that we are talking about? In what ways can those questions appear? The questions can appear in terms of, you might be asked to identify the idea that precedes the passage. That's very interesting and challenging at the same time. What might come prior to this passage, to this entire discussion? What might have prompted this discussion? What might have been the paragraph that came prior to this discussion? What might have it have contained? What follows this entire passage? So logical continuation. You know, unless I understand the structure of the entire passage, the purpose, you know, what's being said, I cannot really get into identifying what might logically continue. This is also so much in keeping with that logical continuation question that used to be a part of CAT. Or, or maybe, uh, you know, I'm just asked as to what is the function of a certain paragraph or a certain line. You know, what role does a certain line play here? What function does this certain paragraph play? Certain line play. The function of the second paragraph or the third paragraph, etc. Or if you look at, let's say, this one, which of the following best describes the relation of the second paragraph to the passage as a whole? They got, or, you know, there could be some example given, some illustration, some facts or data or a reference made to something, some sort of illustration. Why does the author give this example? Why does he give this illustration? The author gives this illustration, this example in this paragraph in order to, you know, it's a very, very typical logical structure question. And the confusion in such questions very often is an option that describes the example versus an option that describes the purpose of the author. So there are two different things. We're talking of two different things. There is an example given. What does this example mean? So you'll have an option that caters to what does this example mean? And that confuses you, that will confuse you. The other will be the option that answers the question. And what is the question? Why has the author used this example? So this example, with regard to the entire passage, the purpose of the author in the passage, what is it trying to serve? Why has the author used this example? He's used this example to convey something. So never pick the option that talks of the example itself, but rather connects the example with the main idea of the passage, okay? Next, what can be the development of ideas in the passage, the method of development? So uh, has he begun with, let's say, is he comparing two theories, comparing and contrasting two theories or two studies? Is he, you know, is there some sort of inductive thought process wherein he's presenting several ideas and he's trying to, you know, extrapolate or he's trying to, you know, generalize on the basis of some examples or incidents? Is he, on the other hand, does he start with a general principle and then he applies this general idea, the law or the rule to a couple of examples and tries to say, you know, how in these examples, these ideas are seen. Could be that, or it could be, you know, he starts with an idea. He starts with a hypothesis. He assumes something that he wants to prove going ahead. And he goes on to prove that. Can even be that. So what is the method of development of ideas? What pattern has he followed to develop the entire set of ideas in the passage, all right? So these are the typical questions. Why is an example given? Why is a mention made of something? Why is an adjective used? Or why is this phrase used? Or what's the role played by a certain line or a certain paragraph? What might come prior to the passage? What might come later and, you know, but the development of ideas, the fourth set, which is how have the ideas been developed? It could even be sometimes, you know, the ideas, how have the ideas been developed in a particular paragraph? You know, how does the author develop this idea or, or this example in this particular paragraph? It can even be that, right? So these are the typical questions that you can encounter in a logical structure 
you know, in terms of logical structure of the passage, we'll have to look at this. Now, before we get into these specific questions, let's understand certain things about uh, structure, all right? So generally, if I want to crack logical structure questions, I will keep in mind certain things. While reading, I identify. I keep track of all these transitional words because it's the transitional words that connect ideas, right? I'm going to keep track of them. I will try and understand while reading, why is he trying to you know, introduce a counter argument? Maybe there is a, somebody else's viewpoint that he talks about. And then he goes on to you know, counter it maybe. Why is he doing that? Why has he brought in this anecdote? So as and when I'm reading, I'll try to relate to all these things. Of course, anticipation, you know, what is to anticipate, to expect what he might logically say later, after all these paragraphs, how is he going to take this ahead? Or a note that you have an adequate comprehension of all these details to ensure that you are taking the correct options. So I have to read carefully, I have to read, and while reading, I must follow, and while reading, I must follow the various details, all right? This is very, very important. Okay, let's look at the next one. One moment, there's some interruption here. I am not too sure if I can admit students here. So you may watch this on YouTube, Rita, right? Okay, yeah. So let's go on. Uh, let's, let's take up an example. Sorry, there was just some a bit of uh, interruption here. All right. So let's take a look at an example, okay? Now here is a paragraph. I'm going to give you a minute to read this paragraph. And then we are going to discuss a few questions in order to understand certain things, right? Certain things related to logical structure. So one minute, you don't even need a minute, a few seconds, quickly read this paragraph. Okay, you will have finished reading the paragraph, not many lines, right? So what does this uh, paragraph talk about? It says, let's look at that first line, genetic engineering, it says genetic engineering may offer the best hope of improving yields of Oriza sativa. It may offer the best hope of improving yields of cultivated rice or Oriza sativa, and perhaps in time other US, important US crops. So as of now, what's the concern of the author? He's recommending genetic engineering as the best hope may offer, but the best hope in improving yields of Oriza sativa or cultivated rice. Are we concerned with other, other crops right now? No, it looks like the concern as of now is just Oriza sativa. The next line talks about how this process can be carried out. How can we carry out this process? A bit of it given here. The insertion of foreign genetic material into the DNA of cultivars appears to confer a herbicidal protection on the resultant plants, enabling them to compete successfully for nutrients with uncultivated grasses. So we use foreign genetic material and when that is inserted into the DNA of these plants, Oriza sativa, it gives them the strength it gives them a herbicidal protection and it enables them to pull out the nutrients from the soil. Otherwise, the nutrients would be drawn out, pulled out by these uncultivated grasses. All right. So it enables them to pull out or compete successfully for nutrients. Now let's look at what is therefore the main idea of the author here. What's his, what's his main idea? What's the point he's making here? 
is talking about how the genetic material can be used in the cultivars. Is that the main idea? Or is the main idea located in the first sentence? Is that the point he's making? Is he recommending? Is he suggesting genetic engineering as the best hope to improve yields of Ariza sativa? Looks like it. Looks like he is recommending this. Okay. So let's put the main idea as genetic engineering to improve yields of cultivated rice. He's recommending genetic engineering as a process to improve yields of cultivated rice. Now, the purpose. Very, very important. We've identified what is he saying, but it's equally important for us to identify why is he saying this? What do you think is his purpose in writing this? It's very closely connected to the main idea, of course, right? The main idea and the purpose go hand in hand. But why has he written this? He's written this to offer, to suggest, to promote, to convince. You can even say that, to convince. To promote this idea of genetic engineering. Please use genetic engineering to improve yields of cultivated rice, is the, is the point he's making. You know, that's exactly the main idea. We said the main idea is genetic engineering can be used to improve yields of Orisa sativa. So why has he written this? Why is he saying this? Because he wants people to take this up. He thinks genetic engineering is a good one, good method, good uh, uh, you know, proposal. And he wants people to take this up. He's trying to convince people of this. So you have a purpose, you have his main idea. Now, let's try and anticipate. What are we doing? Anticipating. What might therefore be the next line here? What is the next idea that the author will bring in? What could be the next idea? Remember what he says next or in the subsequent lines, in the subsequent paragraphs, they all should be connected with his purpose. They all should take ahead the same idea, main idea. Because he writes this for the same purpose. He's not writing this just because he has some information in his hand. He wants to present that information. Randomly, he will write it in a very structured manner. And that structure will come in based upon his purpose. What's his purpose? To convince people, to promote this idea. And therefore, what will he say? So logical anticipation. Let's look at what might be the idea continuing the passage. What might continue? Let's look at a few alternatives here. Perhaps you might just explain the process further. Is that possible? Look at, you know, what is said so far. Look at the last lines, you know, that second line, wherein he talks about the process. So he might just explain this. Why not? He might just go on to explain the process, perhaps. Okay. Next. He's talked about one benefit that genetic engineering brings to the cultivars, to these plants. Maybe he might just go and explain other benefits. Maybe it's cost effective. Perhaps it uh, you know, brings in all these kinds of, it has environmental benefits, whatever. The quality of the plants, the quality of the yield improves, etc. Maybe. He might even give examples of successful conduction. He might just talk about other places where this was used to successfully improve the yields of cultivated rice. Now, while all three appear to be connected to the subject, we'll have to look at the purpose. Let's come back to the purpose. What is the purpose of the author? To promote the idea of uh, genetic engineering, to recommend good to people uh, genetic engineering as a process, and if this is his purpose, he will do his best to take this purpose ahead. Of these three things, what is it that best takes his purpose ahead? Particularly when you understand, he first line my author bolta hai, genetic engineering may offer the best hope of improving yields. Something that has not been tried and tested may offer the best hope. He thinks it's the best hope but may offer. What is the suggestion that maybe a bahut tried and tested nahi hai. But I want you to use this because I think it is the best hope. 
So how will he take this ahead? How will he convince the reader? How will he most convince the reader? And that's what we should look at. Not just about how will we take this idea ahead. If his purpose is to promote this idea, get people to believe in this idea of genetic engineering because he thinks it's the best home, the best method, then he's going to convince people as best as he can. And what will most convince people is giving examples of successful conduction. What will convince people most when you have told that, look, it was conducted in all these places. This country, these places, these states, successfully used genetic engineering and found that their rice, the, the yields of cultivated rice improved by this percentage or this uh, uh, volume, et cetera, right? So the most, if, if we have to choose now within these three, the one that most strengthens the purpose is examples, other, ex, uh, you know, some data, some research data shared, other experiments of successful conduction. Explaining other benefits will also strengthen because if I add, I've already mentioned one benefit here, a very strong one, correct? If I add to these benefits, you know, it's cost effective, etc., etc., many other things. It's not a very time consuming one. It has long lasting benefits, etc. Obviously, it gets strengthened. So the second one is also important. But if you're still to choose between the second and the third, you would choose the third one because the most, uh, you know, very strong evidence that convinces me is when I find that, yes, this has been used. You're not just talk, talking idea now, you're, talk, you're showing me data where it has been used. Explaining the process further will least strengthen the, explaining the process further will least strengthen the purpose of the author. Why are we saying this? Because the process per se will not convince me that genetic engineering may offer the best hope indeed, right? So of the three, if I've got to choose, I will choose the third one as a logical continuation, all right? Okay, I hope this is understood. We're, we're talking here of main idea, understand what the paragraph is saying or what the author is saying, the most important idea, understand the purpose of the author. Why has the author written this? In order to anticipate in order to anticipate what he will say next, or in order to continue what is, what is the, the paragraph or the passage. How will we continue this? In sync with the purpose of the, of the author and the main idea of the passage, right? So this is pretty much what we are going to look at in a slightly extended passage, because a lot of understanding should be had about how is a passage structured and put together? And the moment we understand the structure of a passage, a lot of clarity comes in, okay? So let's look at that. What did we do here? We understood, let me repeat. We understood main idea. We understood purpose of the author in order to anticipate or in order to look at what continues the passage. That which continues will be the idea that most supports the purpose of the author which is why logical purpose. What is the logical purpose of the author? And therefore, logically, he'll take this ahead, okay? Next. So we're going to look at a passage, you know, one paragraph at a time, because we are, we are trying to understand the structure of the passage, all right? This <clears throat> understanding a bit of... of okay understanding a bit of background here would be very relevant when it comes to understanding the whole passage not that in every passage we get some sort of background information but just because we are understanding structure let's also look at this so this passage is taken from the book the triumph of the nomads a history of ancient australia written by jeffrey blaney and what is Jeffrey Bliney doing here? He's a historian who's writing about the Aboriginal history in Australia. Let's understand who the Aborigines are. Aborigines are the original inhabitants of Australia. Just as you say that the original inhabitants or the tribes that lived in the US, you know, in America, 
or the are the native indians or the red indians the native americans it was later that the white european migrated to america and made the us his land united states of america his land likewise the white european migrated to australia and made australia his land but prior to the migration of the white europeans there were tribes living there called the aborigines right let's quickly read this paragraph and then we have sir, a few relevant questions okay a minute for you to read this paragraph please look at it Okay, so I'm sure you read this paragraph. Now my first question to you. And what's our first question? What is the main point of the first paragraph of this paragraph? It's the first paragraph of this entire passage. What is the main point? What is the main point? We'll find it in the first two lines. Aborigines traded between distant people, and this suggests that they had an advanced economic life. How do we get this idea? Where do we get it from? Let's read those lines. Trade between distant people is often seen as a mark of a more advanced economy. Now let's understand what this means. It's often seen. Trading between distant people is often seen. This is a general parameter. You regard, you know, if communities trade with distant people or distant lands, it is taken as a sign of advanced economic life. If this insight is valid, a lot of students would tend to read this incorrectly. If this insight is valid, meaning this insight is not valid. It is incorrect. No, not really. If this insight is valid, if you think this parameter is right, if this is indeed a parameter that is used to mark advanced economic life, then many groups of aboriginals must have been far from backward. Must have been, keywords must have been, far from backwards. Does that mean they were backward? No, they were far from it, meaning the opposite direction. They were not backward, they were advanced. They must have been far from backward, not backward, advanced, because their raw materials and manufacturers were traded to people this hundreds of miles away. And then he goes on to describe probably every tribe in Australia traded with its neighbors, etc. It is probable, right? But put these two lines together. What is he trying to say? That you generally regard trade with distant people as a sign, as a parameter, as a measure of advanced economic life. And if this is right, if this is a general parameter, then by that standard, by this parameter, many groups of aboriginals were advanced because they did the same. They did what? They did whatever you regard as advanced economic life. And what do you regard as advanced economic life? 
trading with distant lands, trading with distant people. So this is the main point of the paragraph that aborigines traded between distant people and that suggests that they had an advanced economic life. This is what you get from these lines. Next, why do you think the author is making this point? Once again, the purpose, why? You will not find it evidently given here, explicitly stated, not given. You'll have to infer that. Why is he saying this? What is he trying to establish? Well, why, well, what is he saying here? He's saying that aborigines were advanced. And he's trying to say that I am regarding them as advanced by the same parameter that you use to regard other people advanced. I'm not coming up with a different standard or a different parameter. I'm using the same parameter. So now let's look at why will he need to call the aborigines advanced? What might his purpose be here? His purpose is to prove that they are advanced. Why does he need to prove that they are advanced? There must be people who believe that the aborigines are not advanced. Why does the author feel the need to prove that aborigines are advanced? There must be people who hold this idea that aborigines are backward, aborigines are not advanced. So his purpose in writing this, why is he writing this? Look, the aborigines who are considered advanced, uh, considered backward, must have had an advanced economic life because they, their economic activity was like anybody else's activity. And if, you know, others, trade with different, uh, distant people, you regard them as advanced. Why are you not regarding these people as advanced, right? So these were also advanced. He's trying to refute that general idea. There must be people who hold the idea that aborigines are backward and he's trying to refute that. So now when you consider this is the point he's making and this is his purpose in making this point, let's look at what might he write, you know? Let's establish the scope of his writing. What is he going to write ahead? You know, what is he going to write in the next few paragraphs? He's surely going to write something that supports this stand that he has taken. This hypothesis that he has established in the first paragraph, it's a hypothesis. What's a hypothesis? A claim that you, you take to be true, you assume to be true and which you are going to, uh, you know, prove. That's what you do in an experiment, a scientific experiment. You start with a hypothesis, which you then go on to demonst demonstrate or you go on to prove that, right? So his hypothesis here is that the aborigines were indeed advanced. They were not backward. You might think they were backward, but they were not backward. He's going to use some data to prove this. He's going to give some strong examples of why and what is the, the detail that he uses that they traded with distant lands. So he's going to give us exactly that piece of information, some evidence regarding that, regarding their trade with distant lands to prove this point, right? Let's take a quick, you know, run through the rest of the passage. Our idea here is not to get into the details of these uh, paragraphs or so, but just understand the gist of all these paragraphs to see how he's built the structure of the entire passage. Right? That's what we're doing here. So next paragraph, and, and look at our next question. I just uh, mentioned it. We just discussed the next question. What do you expect the author will do in the rest of the test? What will, he, what will he do? He will go on to give you evidence regarding the distant trading by the aborigines. All right? Let's look at the next paragraphs. So this is para two. All right? A quick look. Let's not get into a lot of details, but a quick look.
Okay, you may have finished this. It's not very lengthy. All right. You may have finished this not very lengthy paragraph. So we're talking here of, so if I ask you, what is the subject of discussion? This entire paragraph talks about pearl shell trade, correct? Talks about pearl shell trade. And then he goes on to talk of, you know, how far did we find pearl shells being worn? You saw an Aboriginal wearing pearly sh oyster shell, which had traveled at least 500 miles from its point of origin. Now, we understand that pearl shells are found closer to the seashore, correct? So it had traveled at least 500 miles from the seashore or closer to the sea, right? They could be seen suspended from the neck of aboriginals near the Great Australian Bight, which was about 1,000 miles overland from the seabed. Similarly, Kimberley pearl shells were found, etc. And if you look at all these lines, it's being described. You're, you're given examples of how far away, in which different places, away from the sea line, away from the seashore, people wore pearl shells, right? Many hands must have fondled those ears, ocean shells in the course of their long journey to the interior. Their journey consisted of many transactions between neighboring groups, most of which did not know the existence of an ocean. So when it reached certain people, those people who got the pearl shells in their hands, they didn't even know that there was an ocean. There was something called an ocean. If sea cells could travel so far into the interior, it is likely that spears or occurs from the interior were traded in the opposite direction. So obviously trading should have happened in the opposite direction too. So the tribes that lived close to the seashore sent uh, pearl shells into the interior lands. And from the interiors, there was other things that came in like spears or ochre. Ochre is a certain kind of clay, red colored clay that you know the tribals used reaching the hands of people who didn't even know that the world held sweeping plains and deserts. These are those tribals who lived on the, uh, on the seashore or closer to the sea, uh, sea line. And they had never gone beyond that. They'd never seen plains and deserts, but trading happened. Now look at the sophistication of these people and you're calling them tribals and aborigines, okay? So this entire paragraph is all about pearl shell trade. Let's look at the various questions. We've actually answered them. But what is the subject? Now, subject is the broader topic. So what will we establish as the broader topic here? It's the pearl shell trade, trade of pearl shells, correct? What point is being made about this subject? Now you're coming to the main point. Is paragraph ka main point kya hai? The, the main point of this paragraph is trade in pearl shells took place over long distances. And why is he saying this? How does it fit in with the text or with the passage as a whole? This is the data, the concrete data to prove his hypothesis in the first paragraph. What was his hypothesis? What was the stand that he took? That look, the aborigines traded with distant lands and you can't therefore call them backward. They were far from backward because generally people who trade with distant lands, you regard such people as advanced. That is your general parameter, right? So this is how it fits in to provide evidence, okay? Let's look at two more paragraphs now. So this is para three and four. A quick read again, we are not going to get into the details, right? Just a quick understanding, skim karo, you can skim and understand the larger idea, right? Please start. Maybe a minute and a half or so, or two minutes. All right, two minutes for this.
Okay. You would have finished. If not, I'll help you with the relevant lines. As I told you, we are doing a quick skimming of all this. So, uh, in this paragraph, in the third one particularly, the focus is on Axstone. Correct? Axstone also moved over a wide area. So, it's not just the pearl shells, but Axstone also moved over a wide area. And where did it move? Right? So, you are talking about about 40 miles north of Melbourne. You had this Mount William. Stone axes were intermittently mined and shaped there. When the first Europeans arrived with their sheep, the stone was volcanic, etc., etc. The stone is described, doesn't matter. But you find that for generations, stone axes from that quarry. You know what's a quarry, right? A quarry is a mine from which you, you, uh, you know, a, a mine that, that provides for rocks, right? Stone is mined from the quarries. Stone is removed from there. So stone axes from the quarry cut wooden canoes for the rivers. Right, let's proceed. So there were stone axes that were made from the rock or stone taken from these quarries and the axes, the stone axes reached aboriginals as far away as Swan Hill, nearly 200 miles to the north. Look at the extent of trading. Traded as far as 200 miles to the north. Okay. Now this is an example of another piece that another piece or another object that was traded. And then the next para talks about quarries. A quarry which provided stone fit for stronger, sharper axes was likely to supply, supply trade routes stretching in every direction. What does this line mean? That let's say I have a place which has a quarry and it provided good quality stone. What happened? This quarry and therefore this place, is, this place would end up supplying a lot of axe trades. So it would be a very important point in that trade route for stone axes. Okay. And then you find that a lot of quarries are being talked about. So you're describing the quality of quarries, etc. Right? A lot of places are mentioned. But this is the main point of both these paragraphs. So if we are to look at the various questions, what are the questions we have here? What subject is discussed in the above paragraphs? Our answer to this would be in the first paragraph, the subject, you know, that broad topic is trade in Axstone or Axstone trading. And the subject of para four is quarries, correct? How, which quarries, quarries that provided better, uh, better stone rather more than axe stones, better stones. What point is being made about these topics in para three? We are talking about how axe stones were traded as far as 200 miles to the north. They were found, you know, it, at that distance too. And the fourth paragraph, how certain quarries were provided better quality stones and therefore they were heavily mined and therefore those places that had those quarries ended up being an important point in the trade route. They were likely to supply trade routes stretching in every direction, correct? So once again, why does he make this point? This is the second trading example that he gives to support that main point or hypothesis that he makes in the first paragraph regarding, regarding aboriginals that they traded with distant lands, right? Now, with this understanding, let's look at the next paragraphs. Obviously, how is he going to take this ahead? Will he stop with just these examples given? Is he going to stop with these two examples? No, he's going to draw it to a conclusion because you know what he's talked about in the last two paragraphs is not very concrete scientific evidence. He's talked about they were found, they were seen, you know, you, you had people or aboriginals living so far away who wore those uh, um, pearl shells. You axe, axe stones were apparently sent to all these places. These quarries were stronger, yielded better quality. Where is the scientific evidence? And look at how he builds this passage, builds the entire piece of writing. So with para five, let's read this. I don't think you need more than, again, a minute and a half or so. Quickly read this, all right? And then we'll look at the last one, the conclusion. So please take a look at this.
Okay. So, the first line should give you clarity here. First lines of, you know, all paragraphs are very important. First, first line of the passage is so important. You know, we tend to not read it very carefully. Extremely important. Always read the first lines of the entire passage. The first lines of every paragraph too. They give you a lot of understanding. As to at least the direction of the paragraph, direction of the passage, itna to samaj mein aata hai aapko, right? So, uh, what is this paragraph about? The written records were thin in tracing the trade in stone axes from the Tambor district. So other ways of reconstructing the extent of the trade were needed. Did we have any written records? Did we have any concrete data? No. Therefore, we had to you know, reconstruct the extent of the trade in other ways. Petrological analysis was one promising technique. And then something about petrological analysis, it had been used in Southern England to, to understand the blue stone that is used in building Stonehenge, right? So an example given about how it was used elsewhere too. Just to, you know, just to convey the idea that it's not some random thing. Petrological analysis is a tried and tested scientific method. With this technique in mind, okay, this technique in mind, you have an, an archaeologist, Isabel, who examined a total of 517 ax, uh, edge ground axes that had been found scattered in a lot of places. Now, what did she do? She mapped the places where each stone axe had originally been collected. Okay, she mapped them. Where did these stone axe come from? All right. Then, in the laboratory, these stone axes were taken to the laboratory. A thin sliver of slow stone was taken out from each available axe. Right, from each available axe, you know, we have, we have tracked where it was found. All right. And a thin sliver of stone was drawn from this. It was ground to a transparent thinness, etc., and then examined under the microscope. Why was it examined under the microscope? To identify the characteristics of the stone and to search for the place of origin, to search for where did it come from? Which quarry did it come from? And why are we looking for the place of origin? To identify which quarry and therefore which place it came from. In those areas which had been mapped with intensity, the exact quarry which produced some axes could be even be located. Those areas, those quarries that you know gave a lot of that gave you actually good quality stone and ended up being important points on the trade route. You find it could actually be located. You could find that these axes were drawn from there. Okay. So what is this paragraph all about? What's the focus of this paragraph? This paragraph talks of, so if I ask you what is the main, so what's the subject? Axe stone trade, correct? Undoubtedly, you'll tell me that. Sorry, uh, what's the subject? Axe stone trade was the subject of the last paragraph. What's the subject here? Tracing the trade in st uh, stone axes or axe stone or trying to map the places of origin. So a mapping process in order to reconstruct the the, the entire trade route, right? So what point is being made about the topic? Now, this is where the, the second sentence that I gave you will come in, which is, why are we mapping these ax stones to their places of origin? To find out, to reconstruct a, a trade route, right? To reconstruct the trade route. And what have we used here to do that? Petrological analysis. So the subject is, tracking the trade route of stone axes, mapping them, mapping it, reconstructing it. What point about this subject is being made? We've used a scientific technique and that is petrological analysis to map the places where the axe stones were found to the exact quarries that had supplied the stone. Why is this being done? If I ask you the question, why is this being done? The first line gave you clarity. The written records were thin and therefore we wanted better evidence to reconstruct the whole, whole thing. And now the last pass, a paragraph. So look at how he concludes and look at how he's built a very strong argument. This passage is not a randomly written one. It's a very strongly argued one. He set up a hypothesis in the first paragraph. He supports that hypothesis by giving you very concrete data. And that concrete data is the trading 
that they undertook over long distances. So there is pearl shell trade, there is axe stone trade. And then because there were no very strong records, written records or such scientific evidence, a scientific process being used to reconstruct the trade route. Para six, you know, spend a minute on this please, quickly spend a minute on reading para six, just a minute. Okay, not much to read here. I'm sure you finished it. So what is the key point here? What is the most important idea here? What was the outcome of this entire process that was observed in the last paragraph? What was the process? Techno petrological analysis, where you actually examined the stone in order to trace which quarries they were brought from, right? And what was revealed? Look at all these lines, this kind of archeological jigsaw, can only be solved when every likely source of the stone has been discovered and described. In a sparsely peopled territory where, where, where there are less people, you know, less population, the mapping is slow and the geological knowledge is not easily gathered. Nonetheless, you know, though there were all these challenges, nonetheless, they were able to, the researchers, the archeologists were able to gauge the extent of territory or market which was supplied with stone axes. How far did they go? Itna to, they could figure out, right? And they found, what did they find? So look at that final mapping that they arrived at. They found that axes had gone overland through a chain of tribal territories to Kobar, Ghor, Vilcania, and other points on the plains as remote as 500 miles from the home quarries. So were they able to create or, uh, you know, reconstruct a trade map? Yes, they were, right? Though, of course, that geological knowledge and that mapping is slow in such places, itna easily nahi amilta, fir bhi, they were able to, you know, use this scientific understanding to recreate this trade map, right? The longest of these routes, etc. cetera. So, so this, these details, these lines are important. So if I ask you, what is the main point or this, what, what's the main point discussed here? What's the subject? The subject is mapping of axe stone trade using the results of petrological analysis, correct? And what is the point being made about this subject? That, of course, the mapped trade routes, the finally mapped out trade routes were discovered using petrological analysis. And that's what we have here, that axes had gone overland through a chain of tribal territories to Kobar, Gok, Vilcania, etc. right? So look at very starts 
and how he concludes. All right. Look at the, the structure of this passage. You'll see how everything is so logical. So look at some more questions. If I ask you how do paragraphs three to six contribute to the development of the text as a whole, obviously you will tell me that they provide evidence to support the author's claim that aborigines can lead an advanced, economically advanced lives, or or aborigines did lead, right? You can even prove that they did lead an economically advanced life. Which paragraphs and points do you think are more central, and which are less so? Now, if you look at all the paragraphs. and if i ask you which is the most important paragraph here you will tell me that the first paragraph is the most important one right why is the first paragraph most important because the rest of the paragraphs are trying to support that first paragraph right take away the first paragraph the rest of the paragraphs have no meaning at all they have no purpose they are not put together by a purpose they become random pieces of information something talking about pearl shell something talking about axe stone ये सारे पैराग्राफ्स को व्हाट इज इट दैट होल्ड्स देम इन प्लेस द फर्स्ट पैराग्राफ व्हिच एस्टैब्लिशेस द द हाइपोथेसिस अबाउट द ओरिजिन्स एंड देयरफॉर मेक्स द पर्पस ऑफ द ऑथर क्लियर राइट सो फर्स्ट पैरा इज ऑफ कोर्स द मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट वन द सेकंड एंड थर्ड पैराग्राफ्स गिव यू कंक्रीट एविडेंस राइट द फोर्थ पैराग्राफ कैन बी इग्नोर्ड बिकॉज़ इट्स अ डाइग्रेशन इफ यू लुक एट इट इट ओनली टॉक्स अबाउट क्वारीज it talks about the quality of quarries which can easily be ignored para 5 gives you how scientific evidence was obtained or what was the method used to obtain scientific evidence and para 6 gives you categorically what was this evidence right what was the outcome of that scientific investigation so now if i ask you between para 5 and 6 which is more important of course para 6 would be more important the outcome is more important than how it was carried out you know that the scientific process was carried out this way can only be can be provided later if you ask me how did you arrive at this trade route how did you map this out you know how can we rely on this then the scientific evidence can be produced right one more very interesting question why do you think he provides an example from europe of the kind of distance traveled this is this last line of the last paragraph the longest of these routes transposed onto a map of western europe was almost equal to a walk overland from the english channel to the mediterranean why does he give this example of western europe why does he talk of western europe can't he just say look the trading happened over 500 miles it is very important when you consider the background of the passage right there is some background information given we've made the purpose of this paragraph of this passage clear right maybe he wants to give a better sense of understanding to the australians you know 500 miles might not seem like a big deal when you compare it to your continent and you are told that look it was a walk overland from the english channel to the mediterranean the northern part of your continent of europe to the southern part right you understand the extent of the trade you understand that look the trade could have happened across many countries from the northern part of the continent to the southern part across the continent if it had been in europe his reader his target here is the european white man because he's he's targeting those people who believe that the aborigines are backward and it must be the european white who migrated to australia who thinks lowly of the aborigin right so to give them a better understanding so like here is a logical structure question why does he give this example you know now connect it with the larger purpose maybe he wants to give a better sense of understanding to the australian who is originally a european right so we understand the summary the main point in the first paragraph and then you have you know a couple of other paragraphs which which provide evidence and finally the mapped out trade look at how everything is constructed in a very very logical manner it took quite some time over this passage but it was well worth it because understanding how a, a passage can be structured is very very important to your ability to answer a lot of questions based on passages okay so let's move on let's move on to the other details and what are the other details we've understood of course main idea and related questions we looked at that right 
we looked at logical structure questions here. We understood at least a few of them, you know, how to anticipate, uh, how to identify the purpose, how everything is connected to the purpose, what can be the typical. So if you are asked a question as to how, what is the method of development of this passage? What would you say? What is the method of development? He introduces a hypothesis and he builds with evidence. He provides evidence to support that hypothesis, correct? Now, what are these specific detail questions? So two sets of questions that we've discussed, main idea and related logical structure and related questions, right? Let's move on to other question types. What are the other question types? You can have specific detail questions too. What are these specific detail questions? You know, fact-based questions. Maybe in a paper like IFT, you'll find a lot of specific detail questions. Speed exams tend to focus on specific detail questions or those direct questions. Because your ability to scan a passage and pull out that relevant information becomes important. How are they phrased normally? What does the question stem look like? Which of the following is true? Which of the following is false? According to the passage or according to the author? So remember this according to the passage, according to the author can also be inference questions. They can also be followed by options that are inferences. But they can also give you direct details, you know, details that you can scan, look for in the passage and locate. Keywords or lead words, you know, there could be passages that, there could be questions that have some lead words, some sort of cue, you know, maybe uh, an article uh, 21 or so, or the Government of India Act 1935. So now I go looking for that particular keyword. Where is it located? Which paragraph says it or uses it? The author agree, agrees with the following except or but can also include inferences, but they can also give you direct details, right? You know that these fact-based questions don't involve much reasoning because you're actually scanning for data. So in a database passage, like the ones that you normally get in an IFT paper, tend to be heavy on data, tend to give you a lot of facts. And therefore it is but natural, you will have questions that are specific detail. So a speed exam like IFT, and if you're targeting a speed exam like IFT, you will want to build on your skills of looking at the question, looking at the keyword, or the details given in the option and going to the passage, searching for the answers. Will this technique, you know, uh, help you in an exam like CAT, in the CAT passages? Not really. Most of uh, the passages that come in CAT or ZAT, even ZAT, are analytical in nature. And when you have analytical passages, you tend to have more of these reasoning based questions, main idea, structure related, further application, inferences, strengthen, and weaken, which means without reading the entire passage, it is not possible for me to answer even a direct question. Even if a question is direct, trust me, it will somehow have some connections to the main idea. And unless I understand the gist of the passage, I won't be able to answer it. So when it comes to CAT, you must end up reading the entire passage. Anyone who tells me that, you know, I can take all these direct questions first, and then if there are many main idea questions, I will read the entire passage. No, completely incorrect. Because somehow that holistic idea of the passage is important when it comes to CAT. But when it comes to a lot of other exams, speed exams particularly, and when you notice that your passages are heavy on data, you will find that questions tend to be direct. And if the question is a direct one, I needn't really read the entire passage. I can look at that question, the detail given there, go back to the passage, scan the passage for the information. And that's what we normally do in a speed exam. Who has the time to read? In an IFT, who has the time to read those four passages? Impossible, quite impossible. But even a three passages, given the length of the passages, given the limited time that I have, et cetera, it's not really very easy, all right? So specific detailed questions, yes, one big chunk of questions that you can have. But as I told you, according to the author passage or the author agrees with the following except, you have these except questions that have been appearing in CAT over the last several years, very challenging. 
because they are not necessarily direct. They, they also involve, they involve inferences very often. Now, having said that, ye simple location hai, aapko reasoning karne ki zarurat nahi hai. You just need to locate the information. Do understand that specific detail questions actually take more time. That's the challenging part of it. They take more time because you actually have to, you know, go back, say, take a question like accept question. So now you have to figure out that the author agrees with three options and he disagrees with one, doesn't agree with one. So now these three options, I've got to locate these three options in the passage. Where is this information given? And very often there are details. Matlab, I need to go searching for those details. Ki yahan pe bhi aaye, second para mein, third para mein. That's very time consuming. So these passages, these uh, such questions actually take you a lot of time. Whereas the other set of questions, aapne ek baat passage read kiya, main idea hai, and then you are just going to eliminate the options uh, beach may you might you might go back to the passage and check etc right so that is the third set of questions i hope that is clear to all of you now there is a fourth set okay what is this fourth set of questions we call them further application questions understand that word further application i am extending the data given to me in the passage so the passage says something based on what the passage has said, I am applying, I'm extending, I'm looking for newer things, but they're all related to the passage. Are they stated in the passage? No. So I might have a question, which of the following would the author most likely agree with or least likely agree with? And I'll find that the options are not given. You know, the options bring in some details that are not given in the passage. But that is how the question is. It expects me to apply, further apply what is given in the passage on the, so if the above is true, will this be true? Will the author agree with this? Because he says ABC, he talks about ABCD. Will he also agree with this? Extending the ideas given in the passage. The most likely, least likely questions can also give you inferences. Okay. You know, what is drawn from what is given in the passage. Aisa bhi ho sakta hai. But look at that second one. So there is a theory discussed. There is some new research discussed maybe, right? Now the question is, this theory would be a likely application of which of the following fields? It's not mentioned. Those fields are not mentioned in the paragraph. Aapko guess karna hai on the basis of what is given there, right? Or, uh, you know, the, the anecdote described in the passage is most likely to you know come from which field the the ideas presented by the author in this passage are most likely to to be drawn or to be applied to which field etc right something along those lines likely to find application in which of the following areas or this parallel reasoning question you know what parallel reasoning is so that's also application because you're picking an idea given in the passage, right? You pick an idea and you are asked to find which of the options have a similar reasoning pattern. So there is a reasoning pattern in one of the ideas. One of the ideas is picked up, put in the questions and you are asked which of these four questions, four options have a similar line of reasoning. And are those options taken from the passage? No, they are not. Wo hypothetical hai, imaginary hai. Diya nahi hai passage mein, right? That's why it's application. Extend the reasoning given in the passage to something else. Can you apply this to some other situation? That's parallel reasoning. Okay. There used to be this uh, interview question once upon a time. I think that was CAT 2012 and CAT 2013. We saw a lot of such questions in those two years. If you were an interviewer, what question would you ask the author? Can be taken as an application question. Because you would, you would want to extend what is given there, either ask the author to continue his thought. You know, you've given us so much. Can you, you know, give us some more details about it? Or maybe support with examples, one of the ideas given there. 
you said somewhere here you said something like this can you give us some examples to support this to to further explain this right so your interview questions as an interviewer if you are a set if the question is if you are an interviewer what question would you ask the author you would ask questions on these lines how can we continue this passage take this ahead you know can you talk of the application of this you know your new study the new ideas that you propose how do you think this can be implemented take this ahead talk of an implementation plan or it can even be can you corroborate further can you provide more examples to strengthen what you are saying in the passage never can you ask a question that becomes repetitive repetitive nahi ho sakta because it's already given there you can't ask a question about something that is already mentioned are ye to redundant hai that's redundant it's already given right so as an interviewer if you're asked to uh, ask a question to the author it will have to be very logically connected to what is said but not redundant not repetitive okay we haven't seen that question type for quite quite some time but you never know right you never know what kind of surprises can come up so uh, i think these were this was the focus of today's lecture discussing logical structure understanding logical structure looking at logical structure related questions understanding the other two category of questions specific detail and further application all right and as promised in the last lecture we are also going to spend a quick few minutes on understanding tone remember we talked of tone tone is very much connected with the main idea so what the author is saying his purpose for saying this will also indicate will also uh, carry with it his feeling his attitude towards what he is saying what does he feel about what he is saying so what he says will also bring with it what he is feeling about it right let's look at it so tone as well as the style of the author or how he is written very much connected to the type of passage these two words are interchangeably used all right so how to identify tone obviously main idea and primary purpose i have to look at that what is he saying what's the subject what's the main idea why is he saying this that will determine whether is positive about it negative about it right there can be positive tones negative tones there can be you know a neutral tones so all of this depends on what is he saying and what is his primary purpose read the language carefully i will identify of course the depth of the subject you know kitna how much has he explored that subject wo to hame identify karna hi hai but along with that the language can also be very indicative kis tarah ka language author ne use kiya is it very strong uske adjectives kaise hai is he using is he using very strong adjectives adjectives adverbs they contain the the you know judgments of the author they are, they contain the tone of the author if he uses a positive adjective it means the tone is something positive if it's a very very positive one eulogic maybe you know is extremely is very full of praise of the author right now you know there are words that he uses to excessively praise the author, praise the praise the topic or praise whoever is talking about obviously author's tone is very positive right maybe a eulogic tone etc no clearly the meanings of the tones in the options you should also know the meanings of the words sometimes we uh, we are able to understand what the author is saying but we are not able to eliminate the other options and therefore i'm stuck there the the common tones that come in let's also know what these words mean okay we're going to quickly look at some common words what are these some common words so subjective tone objective tone you know objective when does objective come in when he doesn't give an opinion maybe he just describes there is no opinion he doesn't make a judgment regarding that what is the author's opinion we don't know he is just presenting two viewpoints he is just presenting the pros and cons perhaps he is just presenting two uh, theories what does he say about this theory nothing we don't know no bias here no opinion expressed right subjective when he gets involved and he takes a stand he takes a stand with something right he makes a stand clear there cynical so let's talk critics critical <coughs> excuse me let's talk critical as well as cynical <coughs> let's
let's talk cynical let's talk critical as well as cynical what is critical so if i criticize you you know i students i criticize my students i point out that look this is not how you should go about it you should do your homework if you don't do your solving there is no application of whatever you've learned etc now i'm criticizing i'm pointing out what is wrong because i want this to be changed i want some improvement there criticism is generally regarded positive you know constructive hota hai criticism is not just to point out something wrong criticism is to point out something is wrong so that the correction is made correct which is constructive therefore the purpose tends to be positive it's like feedback i i am sure if there are working students you will understand what i mean feedback given to you the feedback is meant to improve you all right whereas when you talk of cynicism it is bitter criticism criticism for its own sake that's called you know criticism for its own sake you know you're criticizing just because you want to criticize it is not meant for a purpose bitter criticism for its own sake wherein you dismiss you are not giving you're not pointing out what is wrong on the basis of some facts or so you're just dismissive of that person jo bhi wo karta hai wo kharab hi hai is tarah ka you know the typical attitude of the opposition towards the ruling government in any case wherever we go you know whoever is in the opposition always tends to be very cynical of anything done by the ruling government you know take the center take the stage stay look at things anywhere that is cynicism okay bitter criticism for the sake of it extremely cynical if you, if you have a cynical view of life you don't appreciate anything in life you know something happens what's the big deal you know ek din to everything gets over you know that kind of attitude argumentative very strong language regretful you know when you lament when you cry over something regretful can also be called lamenting tone indifferent ap apathetic remember that word apathy to show no feeling at all jaise hum bolte hain you know the look at the government's apathy here indifference taking no stand taking showing no uh, response at all you know no emotion at all thought provoking when there are questions raised and you know they make you think exaggerated biased you know where you are saying something and not supporting it with facts bias aata hai extremely for extremely you know uh, against right that's a bias not supporting it with data positive negative cautiously optimistic you know first of all optimistic pessimistic pessimism is you know not being hopeful of something being very negative about it optimism is being positive and hopeful about it right i'm optimistic about cat because i think i've done my preparation i'm fairly well grounded i'm looking forward to it i'm hopeful optimistic right sarcastic nice word sarcastic sardonic satirical all right three words here let me type them here so sardonic can be taken as a synonym for sat sat uh, for sarcasm and what is sarcasm you say something and you mean the exact opposite of it right not lesser classic sarcasm is you mean the exact opposite of it but sarcasm can also be when i mock you know when i ridicule people when i make fun of something and put things not in a very straight forward man manner so i'm making fun of something or someone i'm using sarcasm right in order to criticize so sarcasm always comes in in order to criticize remember that so that sarcasm sardonic can be a replacement for sarcasm there's also this word satirical that is used right and what is satirical satire is also the same thing for example george orwell's animal farm is a satire it's a satire on communism you must read george orwell i've always been recommending this for us for all our students uh so why is it satire why is why is it satirical it says something you know it it says something but it means something else it means the opposite of it that's why it's a satire in common language when you use sarcasm so you say something and you mean the opposite of it in common language you use the word sarcasm or sardonic 
The word satirical is used when your language is literary. And when do I call my language literary? When I see some figures of speech in the language. What kinds of figures of speech? What is a figure of speech? Maybe a simile, maybe a personification, maybe a metaphor, right? When such language is used, you can call it satirical, all right? So satires are famously novels, plays, play, uh, you know, dramas or poems, etc. These have been satires, which is why the word satirical is used in connection with in connection with literary writings, literary language. So wherever you find a figure of speech and there is sarcasm involved, you will call it satire, right? What else do we have? Illustrative, frivolous, a very casual attitude, you know, treating something serious in a very casual, silly manner, right? Pedagogical, okay, let's put didactic and pedagogical together. What is didactic? A very common word, we've seen this in many such CAT papers, many aptitude exam papers actually. A didactic tone is an instructional tone, a tone in which you seek, set out to instruct, right? Uh, convey a message, you know, give some learning, educative jo hai, right? So we can also connect pedagogical here, pedagogical and didactic can be put together because pedagogical is also instructional. The purpose of pedagogical, so if you call a piece of writing, the author's tone here is pedagogical, he sets out to educate, inform, you know, teach, it's instructive, instruct the reader, right? Narrative tone, where does the narrative tone come in? Neutral can be put together with, you know, uh, objective, etc. No, no stand taken, right? Indifferent, objective. When, the, when does the tone get narrative? The narrative tone comes in when you are narrating a story. It could be somebody's real life experience. My real life experience as an author, somebody's real life experience, something real that happens in life or a story format, anything put in a story format is narrative, right? Becomes the narrative, a story, right? Narrative tones are very easy to identify. Okay, let's take this ahead. All right, and what do we have on the next... Uh, so we have an interesting exercise here, match the following, all right? You have some sentences given, can be a little challenging because, you know, tone cannot be located very easily in just one sentence. Sometimes you need multiple sentences, you need an entire passage. Fir bhi, we'll try and make the best of this. So there are some sentences given on in one column and in the next column, your right-hand column, you have these words given which indicate tones, okay? I'll just give you a brief of these various tones. So optimistic, we know, condemning is to, to you know, strongly criticize in a very strong manner, to say ki aapne achha nahi kiya, right? This is absolutely wrong. That's a tone of condemnation. Analytical tone, you know what analysis of a passage is or the, uh, an analytical piece of writing. What is analytical? Where you examine something in both ways, right? You look at the positives of it, you look at the negatives of it, you do a holistic kind of examination and you arrive at maybe how to set things right, which problem solving type, right? Just my complexity hota hai. Philosophical, anything that is abstract, right? Spiritual, uh, spirituality, religion, is taraka discussion is always philosophical. Pessimistic, jantayam, lamenting is a regretful tone, a tone of mourning over something, crying over something, right? That's lamenting. Can we take a quick look at it, right? I'll, I'll give you about a, a minute or two and then discuss one thing at a time, right? Take a quick look at things.
Okay. If you had a look at this, let's discuss quickly. So the first one, there cannot be any reason to condone such an act of defiance. Look at the word condone. What does that mean? Forgive. I cannot, I cannot, I have no reason to forgive such an act of defiance. What is defiance? To defy, to challenge, to question. Such an act of defiance cannot be forgiven. I am criticizing, I am criticizing very strongly and therefore it should be condemnation. Correct? I'm condemning. No matter how much you try, something or the other will invariably go wrong. It's the fault in my stars. It's something like, you know, I'm fated. This is my fate. It's always wrong. It's a, you know, things always go wrong. It's written in my stars. So that is obviously pessimistic. You're being very pessimistic here. Correct? Something was always going, something uh, will always go wrong. Looking back at our lives, regret is inevitable. Look at the word regret. I'm, you know, crying over something, regretting that. Look, there are things that we missed and there are things that missed us. There are things that I missed. There are things that missed us. So I feel, I find regret. I'm regretting the past. That's your lamenting tone. When you regret, when you cry over, when you mourn over something. When you put in your best effort and have a strong heart, nothing will go wrong. Clearly optimism, right? Don't worry, nothing will go wrong. You know, optimism. Because the pursuit of truth must drive our karma rather than be justifying the rationale behind our actions. The pursuit of truth, look at those words. Karma, I'm talking abstract things. My karma should be driven by the pursuit of truth. Now, you know, I'm not talking at a lower level. These are high ideals and, you know, connected with spirituality. The moment we, you know, look at the subject itself, the very idea, the topic of discussion, that's philosophical. As we go deep, we realize that reasons are way denser than earlier belief. As I analyze, as I explore something, I find that the reasons are denser than earlier belief. Now, this is analytical. Look at the process. How am I approaching something? I'm approaching the idea. As the more I explore, the more dense the reasons get, right? The more complex things become. So it's analytical, okay? Let's take a look at one more uh, set of uh, sentences and words. So uh, sentences you will read on your own, right? Let me explain the words to you. So the first word is laudatory. Let me compare laudatory with the, maybe eulogizing, okay? So when you, when you laud something, you are applauding, applaud dena, applause dena, right? Applauding. So laudatory is appreciative, right? To appreciate, balanced appreciation, appreciation supported by facts. You know, I have some evidence, something that has actually been done and I applaud that, appreciate it. You know what the narrative tone is, you know the story tone. Sarcasm, we spoke of that, you say something, but you need the opposite. Hyperbole, hyperbole, a lot of you would put it that way. Its actual pronunciation is hyperbole. You know, there's an accent mark on the last E. What is a hyperbole? It's a figure of speech in which you exaggerate something, correct? You exaggerate. I'm so hungry I could eat a horse, that's a hyperbole. Eulogizing, what is the eulogic tone? What is to eulogize? So a eulogy, you meaning good and logos meaning word, science, study. That is etymology for you. So a eulogy is good words etymologically. A eulogy is the funeral speech rendered at the funeral of a person. The speech that is given at the funeral of a person. Obviously, a funeral speech is never negative. You never talk anything negative about a person who's gone away, passed away. It's very positive. In fact, it tends to praise, you know, pick on all those positive things and if not just appreciate, but praise. So eology is full of praise for the person who's just left this world. And that is what you mean when you use this word in the in an adjectival form or as a, as a verb. So the extended meaning of eulogy. So when I say the author has a eulogic tone, 
What do I mean? I mean that he's praising excessively. Excessive praise is eulogic. Your theologize is to praise excessively. Humorous, we know what this word means, right? But you'll find that there are very thin lines uh, between some of these words, okay? Take a quick look at it, maybe just a minute or two, and uh, let's discuss, okay? I'm giving you a minute or two so that you read the sentences and you absorb the meanings. Otherwise, it will make no sense, okay? Okay, you will have read the sentences and I'm sure you're confused with a few things. So let's eliminate the easy ones. You know that the fourth one here is narrative, correct? Story form, clearly, no doubt about that. As the moon slowly drifted through the sea of stars, hope flourished that soon it will be morning and the caravan would restart its journey, that is narrative. Let's look at the third one and, and the fifth one, okay? Let's look at the third and the fifth one. One can cite half a dozen reasons for a stellar growth, but a lion's share has to be attributed to the CMO who is led from the front like an able captain should. I am appreciating the CMO who's led from the front like an able captain. So this is fact driven. Am I going over the board in praising this person? No, I'm saying that our stellar growth is largely because of the CMO who is led from the front like an able captain. I'm applauding what he's done, laudatory tone. But look at the fifth one. There is absolutely no doubt Napoleon Bonaparte is a resurrection of Christ and shall return to lead France like Jesus returned on Easter Sunday. I am comparing Napoleon Bonaparte with Christ, you know, God himself, resurrection of Christ. This is exaggerating something here, right? But I am excessively praising a person. 
you know, praise that is exaggerated, too much praise. This is clearly eulogizing. But then you might wonder, why can't this be hyperbole? What is hyperbole? It's defined as exaggeration, right? Excessive exaggeration. Exaggeration itself is excessive. Exaggeration of something. Can you exaggerate a person? Or do you praise a person excessively? You can't exaggerate a person. You can exaggerate a situation. And what's the situation we are exaggerating here? Look at this, the opposition is stalling the passage of stalling, preventing the passage of GST bill in parliament because their entire existence of 180 years is now condensed into one strategy. And what is this one strategy? Opposed tooth and nail regardless of logic. So 180 years ka existence of this party is brought down to one strategy. Isn't that exaggeration? Yes, it is. I'm exaggerating, you know, what these people have achieved or planned or strategized over 180 years, imagine. So here is a situation, a party, an organization and their strategy that is exaggerated. Whereas the last but one is a person who is praised excessively. Therefore, that is eulogic. The third one is applauding, laudatory, right? Now, the first and the second. In the first one, he's as much a leader of the group as the fly sitting on the shield of the soldier charging in the first line. What's the point I'm making here? He's as much a leader of the group as that fly sitting on the shield of the soldier. Meaning, in other words, he is a fly. He's not a leader. That's what I mean. He's just not a leader. I'm making fun of this leader by comparing him to that fly sitting on the shield of this soldier and meaning the opposite, that he is not a leader. That is sarcasm. You can see the sarcasm there. I'm criticizing the leader. I'm making fun of him. And I'm saying, you know, something, but meaning the opposite. Whereas in the second one, if I were to choose between a donkey and you, Mr. President, for a groom, you would die a bachelor. You Can you see explicit humor here? There is humor, right? There is explicit humor. You know, you, you have a smile when you, when you find that, you know, the choice would be a donkey. So this is humorous. The difference between the first and the second, the second is humorous, the first is sarcasm, because I mean the opposite of what I'm saying, right? Okay, slightly tough ones, but I hope there is clarity. Do we have time for a passage? I wish I could get a response from all of you. If you could take a passage that includes everything, which is uh, the, some of the logical structure questions that we discussed today, that'll be great. Here is a passage, a paragraph with just a few questions. Okay, four questions only. I think it's not going to take us a very long time to look at it. So here is a logical structure question. Why does the author refer to the American speech forms? The author's overall argument is that the author is most likely profession, the most appropriate title. Let's look at some of these things, okay? I don't think it's going to take us a long time, right? So maybe uh, 10 minutes that we need, right? I think uh, I'll keep the screen on for uh, four or five minutes for you to read the passage first, all right? And then you can uh, solve the question, first question, one minute per question, and then we'll keep moving, right? There are only four questions, so it won't take us a lot of time. You might need to spend a four or five minutes to read the passage, right? It is, um, you know, the, la la the idea needs to be followed very clearly, okay? Take a look at this, start reading the passage, and this is the last agenda for the day. I don't want to close abruptly without a discussion of a passage. Somehow it looks incomplete, all right? So let's take this up. Five minutes to read the passage, okay?
I hope you've finished. If you haven't read the entire passage and you still don't have clarity, let me highlight a few lines to help you arrive at the main idea, okay? So, uh, we're talking of the experience of speech, okay? In Britain, the question of good speech is confused and it's a source of division in our culture. It is inevitable that our regional speech forms should move closer to each other. So now we are talking of Britain where there are divisions in the culture because there are different speech forms that are used. So it is quite inevitable that regional speech forms should move closer and extreme forms should disappear. But this should be a natural process. Now what is happening is that you have different ways of speaking English, okay? But then there is no natural process that we are taking of letting all these various speech forms. So basically we are talking of how people speak English differently. Maybe the pronunciation, the accent, you know, some of the syntax, some of the structure of the language also, right? But we should allow these speech forms to naturally, you know, come together. Certain extreme forms will disappear. The ones that are close to each other will join, something like that. It should be a natural process. But what is happening is that the mistake is to assume that there is already a correct form of modern English speech. And that's a standard. And what is this correct form of English speech? It is regarded, you know, public school English. This is the form that is regarded as a standard. The form in which many have tried to fix it cannot become a speech form in this country. Now, what is the author saying? You fixed public English, uh, public school English as the standard form of using English, but that cannot become a common speech form in the country as a whole. Why? Both, look at that word, both, because of the social distinctions associated with its use. Now, when I use the word social distinction, what do I mean? I'm referring to social classes. So you connected, uh, you're, you're connecting it with social classes. There is some sort of social idea that connects with, you know, you using this particular speech form. And second reason, because of the powerful influence of American speech forms, okay? So two reasons why he says it should not be fixed as one particular uh, standard, public school English is the correct English. Yet many forms of good modified regional speech are in practice emerging and extending. The dialect, the barriers imposed by dialect are reduced in these forms, etc, etc. And this is the path of growth, he says. Don't assume that there is a correct English. The path of growth should be a natural mixing and merging of different ways of speaking. Yet in much speech training in schools, what do we do? We go on assuming that there is one correct form of English. We've already said that in the first few lines too, right? There is one correct form of English all over the country. And then you are made to feel that if you don't speak that language, you are inferior. This sets up deep tensions, active feelings of shame and resentment. If we experience speech training as an aspect of our social inferiority, you know, it makes you feel inferior. It makes you feel that if I, I cannot speak public school English, so I do not belong to that class. I belong to a different class, right? It makes you feel inferior. A fundamental cultural division gets built in. And therefore, the author does not like it. But does it mean, therefore, we should stop speech training? So he's not against speech training. He says, speech training to karna hai. But it is not about fixing a standard. We'll not get near a common culture in Britain unless we make it a real social process. Make it a real social process. And what's a real social process? Listening to each other and, you know, naturally, gradually picking things from each other's forms and therefore a new form evolving, right? It should come on its own. It should happen on its own rather than making someone imitate a social class, ki ye rich class hai, public school wale hai, right? They speak this language and therefore all of us should. Nothing is more urgent than to get rid of this arbitrary association between general excellence and the habits of a limited social group. 
what is this limited social group the the class that goes to public school public school english right that's a class so if you think that that is the correct language there is an arbitrary association quality is being connected with the class arbitrary random connection that you make between quality and a class so last line if you associate the idea of quality with the idea of class you may find both rejected because as people will increasingly refuse to feel inferior on arbitrary social grounds don't make this arbitrary connections don't force fit something on people let these forms of language evolve emerge as a natural dynamic social process right a fix mat karo isko put all these things together what is he saying we are wrong in establishing public school english as the standard english aise aise karne se kya hoga you know the natural coming together of different forms of regional forms will not happen right we we associate class with quality if you do this because that class that speaks public that goes to public school speaks public english they are the correct class they are the quality and i must imitate that quality so inferiority sets in and when you find that when you that when you associate quality with class people will reject something like this because no person wants to feel inferior so speech training cannot be a successful thing let's look at what is the you know main point i think that question comes later why does the author refer to american speech forms let's get to you know these lines let me erase all of this all of this highlights right and get to these lines where are the american speech forms mentioned in these lines right so he says public school english in the form in which many have tried to fix it cannot become a common speech form in the country both because of the social distinctions associated with its use and because of the powerful influence of american speech forms so why does he refer to american speech forms logical structure question always relate an example to an idea right he mentions american speech forms in the context of how there is powerful influence of the american speech forms right and because of the powerful influence of other field speech forms you can't fix one form as the standard so two reasons that he gives social distinction ho jata hai you're connecting quality with the class wo galat hai second aajkal itne regional forms emerge ho rahe hain american speech forms etc aa rahe hain so you can't just have one standard so why does he refer to the american speech forms to highlight the main reason behind the corruption of spoken english is it the main reason no it's not the main reason so let's eliminate this there are two reasons that he gives right to criticize the undue emphasis laid on public school english can we say this is it well, let's just part b to state one of the reasons for reluctance to accept a particular form of english let's look at d to explain why british english is no more an effective mode of communication is he talking of british english not being a good form of communication no that is too generalized let's look at b and c is he criticizing the undue emphasis laid on public school english or is he talking of american speech forms as one of the reasons why we cannot use a standard form given public school english as you have given it cannot be accepted why one reason is that you are connecting class with quality sorry you are connecting yes quality with social class second reason is that you know there are so many american speech forms and Amer and regional forms emerging right so between b and c what do we narrow down our answer to c it's not about criticizing the undue importance given to public school but rather to offer a reason why we cannot accept one form fixed by you because there's so much dynamic change happening right and that is c let's look at the next one okay so since we've discussed the passage the other question should be very easy let me clear this yeah question 2 a quick look at it 
So what is the author's overall argument here? Let me read the options for you. Speech training in Britain schools is an obsolete process that should be discarded. Is he criticizing speech training? Look at this line. This does not mean that speech training, where is this? We should stop tra speech training. He doesn't, he's not against it. It's obsolete, it's enabled, right? The way in which you're going about it, that's incorrect, right? Speech training in uh, Britain's schools leads to development of social inferiority. Ah, there is a mention of social inferiority. Speech training in Britain schools is too rapid and bigoted. You know what is bigoted? Intolerant. And it's very quick or that it's intolerant. That's not the point. Now you're, you know, getting too generic. Maybe you're bringing in things that have not been mentioned. What he says is that, you know, you have set a process, which is wrong, right? Speech training. So let's eliminate this as well. It's not obsolete. It's not rapid and bigoted, right? Okay. Speech training in Britain schools is founded on the arbitrary association of quality with class. Let's compare B and B. Why he does say that speech training in Britain schools leads to development of social inferiority. That's one of the reasons that he gives to talk of what shouldn't be done. Why will people reject one standard English that you've taken? People will reject that one standard form because you are associating quality with class. It's an arbitrary association. That will make people reject speech training. Why will they reject it? Because, you know, that will end up developing social inferiority in them. That will make them feel inferior. You've connected quality of language, quality of speech with the class of people who speak it. That will make them inferior. So his overall argument is not that it will lead to development of social inferiority. That's one of the reasons used to reject the process that has been taken. The process is a connection between quality of speech and class. Right? So your answer is D here. Your answer is D, option D. Okay? Let's look at the next one. Next, very easy question again, because we've already done this. The author is most likely by profession. Education reformer looks like it, because the context is that of education and change in the way in which we teach speech to people. Right? Equal rights activists, no. While it looks like, you know, there are classes involved, he uses the idea of class and all that. It's not really an equal rights activist. You know, there is no activism here. Activism happens when you, when you are addressing the government, when you're bringing, you know, asking for some change, some political action. Is there a language? A public policy critic, you know, looks like it, but slightly broad now. You know, can I just talk about public policy here? You know, it's specific to how we teach our people language. Anthropologist is way away, right? So we will narrow down between C and A, we will narrow down to an education reformer because we're talking of something that is done in educational field and some change that is suggested, correct? So A is our answer. The most appropriate title for the passage is, can be a little tricky, but let's look at, you know, eliminating, fading British English. Am I saying that British English is fade or I? That is too generally, uh, generalized, right? You're talking about the language fading. No, his, 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 his comment is very specific. So is he talking about D? What is wrong with the education system of English, English education system? The British education system, you know, educational system is too broad now. You're talking here of, you know, speech training. How do we teach the right language to our children? So D is too broad. A is again generalized. You know, I'm not saying that British English is fade. Ho hai. Now between B and C, is it a defense of teaching English? Is he say, you know, is he approving what is being done? Is he saying, jo humne process abhi follow kiya hai, that is correct? No, he's actually criticizing it, right? He's pointing out what is wrong with the way in which we have established the process. Humne process kya kiya? Ki ek particular language style sahi hai bola. Now that language style of a group ends up being a social group. Uske saath you are connecting, you know, a quality with class. You've arbitrarily connected the two. 
that will make people feel inferior and they refuse to feel inferior, they will reject this, right? So he's pointing out the errata, the error that we're making in the teaching of English. So C is our answer here, okay? Yeah, I think there, were, there are only four questions there, fine. So we'll stop with this, okay? Uh, we've discussed quite a bit and we've exceeded time today. Thank you so much for being patient. I hope this was useful learning. I wish I could suggest a lot of solving for you people. There's, a lot, there's plenty of solving on our portals and our modules. A lot of practice uh, for all these question types. But if you don't have access to it, obviously I cannot recommend that, right? So thank you so much. And a reminder again, we have our Endeavor Open Mock Cat on Friday, starting Friday 5 p.m. till Sunday 4 p.m., followed by a webinar on the changed cat pattern at 5 p.m. on Sunday. All right. And that will be followed by the analysis of Endeavor Open Cat. The, the description box will give you the link. Please do register for the mock so that we send you uh, the login. You cannot take the mock unless you get the login. Please do register for it, right? It's going to be a two hour mock, 40 uh, minutes uh, uh, each sectional, just on the lines of the revised CAT pattern, right? So we're looking forward to all of you performing well in this mock. Thank you so much. Good night, all of you. Take care.